Shall we get started? Is this microphone okay? Last time it didn't work very well. How about now? It still works, right? Okay, let me know if you cannot hear in the back so that we can adjust. Okay, I think we're, we're getting to the end of the course. We have three, four more weeks, is that correct? Maybe eight more classes. So hopefully it'll be fun. And you'll have another lab that's going to be released tomorrow. Okay, so we'll continue uh, emerging memory technologies from where I left off. Last week you had a guest lecture from Stefan Meyer from Apple. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you didn't come, sorry, you missed it. Uh, and uh, we, we may get back to prefetching later on. Actually, we'll get back to it in your lab. Uh, but the emerging memory technologies actually will benefit from prefetching quite a bit as well. If you have a hybrid memory system, especially especially with the latencies that are increasing uh, with some of the emerging memory technologies, like we've discussed, uh, phase change memory, prefetching may be a good option to bridge the gap between processor speed and memory speed in this case as well. Okay, so this is one of the things that we were talking about. We stopped here. These are hybrid memory systems or heterogeneous memory systems. Basically, you put together multiple different technologies with different characteristics, different greens and different reds, and you design the system such that uh, you manage the data allocation and movement between these different technologies to achieve the best of each technology while avoiding the bad parts of each technology. Right? That's the idea of heterogeneous uh, memory systems. And you can imagine how prefetching can fit in nicely here. Right? If, you, uh, if you can predict that some data requires fast access, for example, between fast and slow memory, you have a prefetcher that prefetches it from the uh, slow memory, but large memory, into the uh, fast memory just in time hopefully. And certainly that, that could play a role in any part of the hierarchy. In fact, Stefan didn't talk about the higher level uh, examples of prefetching, but prefetching is really employed in, in software systems as well. So the operating system in this machine is, for example, predicting what programs I'm going to access. And it's trying to prefetch those programs into the physical memory before I actually access them. You can actually, people actually have uh, very predictable usage patterns in their computers. And if you can predict those usage patterns, you can warm up your physical memory with the contents that you're supposed to fetch from the disk much earlier than you really need to fetch those contents from the disk. That's the idea. So it's very simple, actually. Sometimes people call it read ahead, for example, in disks. You read ahead and fetch stuff that you're supposed to, or you think that you're supposed to access uh, from, from the disk. So it's a very general idea. You can do it, you can apply it to even higher level systems, data center systems, for example, right? If you're, if you're supposed to launch a job somewhere, or if you're supposed to migrate a virtual machine somewhere, you can predict that that migration will happen for whatever reason, and you prefetch the contents of the virtual machine to that particular uh, machine that you're going to migrate the virtual machine to. So that's a very general uh, concept to tolerate latency. Okay, but going back to the emerging memory technologies, uh, basically, uh, this is a big challenge and opportunity that we were discussing. How do we provide the best of multiple metrics with multiple memory technologies? And we talked about a bunch of different approaches. In the first part of this lecture, I'm going to talk about some, uh, some other things. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail uh, in this part, uh, because there is a lot of work that's going on that clearly we're not going to be able to cover in this area. But it's also an ongoing research topic. I'll just, just give you some basic ideas and overview. Does that sound good? Okay. So basically, this is a slide that I also covered very briefly again. These are some of the issues that you have in a hybrid memory system. How do you use either of the technologies? Do you use, a, do you use one as a cache and the other as a main memory? Or do you use both of them as main memories, meaning that you partition the main memory space between two memories, which has implications on the software stack, of course, right? If you, if both, D, let's, uh, let's assume that in this picture, if both DRAM and phase change memory are part of your memory address space, you're really partitioning your memory address space or having two different address spaces, which is similar to partitioning again. But now the burden is on someone to allocate the uh, memory uh, to either DRAM or phase change memory, right? Usually the programmer. Usually the programmer does the memory allocation. And the programmer may be responsible for that allocation over here. But of course, compiler can guess that as well. Operating system can potentially guess where to allocate as well, depending on the characteristics of the data uh, that you're allocating. But if you use this as a cache, then this could be completely transparent to the programmer, completely transparent to all of the parts of the system, except for the hardware, potentially, right? Uh, if you manage it as a hardware-managed cache, of course, right? Then the question is how do you manage this huge cache, right? Assume that this is, I don't know, uh, eight gigabytes 
and this is maybe two terabytes or so. I'm just making up these numbers. How do you manage this large cache right, in the hardware? We're going to talk about that actually as the next thing. We talked about uh, what data to place into DRAM versus phase change memory uh, briefly last time. There's also an issue of granularity of data movement or management. Should it be at the cache block level? Should it be at the page level? Should it be at a higher granularity? This is important. We're not going to cover a lot, but I'm going to give you something very briefly about this. Uh, should it be, uh, we already discussed this briefly, should the hardware manage the cache or main memory, should the software manage it or should it be done cooperatively? When do you migrate the data? Of course, somebody needs to answer that question. And how do you design a scalable and efficient large cache? So we're going to tackle this a little bit uh, today. And that's about this basically. So if you, if, you have, uh, if you treat one of the memories as a cache, then what you have in your hand is a very large cache. Right? Uh, you may want DRAM to be still large. As the data set size are growing, we want terabytes and terabytes of memory actually going forward. Uh, you could argue that we should use it efficiently, and I agree that you should use it efficiently. But even if you use it efficiently, you may actually, uh, you may actually have a need for very large uh, memories. Uh, then you have a large, large cache as well. And this large cache is certainly interesting. Uh, it's residing off chip. It's similar to the cache that you designed uh, uh, in your lab in some ways. But it's also different in the sense that it's huge, right? Assume that again, this is, let's say, 8 gigabytes. Uh, and if, you're, if your management granularity is 64 bytes, you have a lot of blocks to keep track of in the cache, right? We did this exercise last time uh, when I discussed, so you can actually do this exercise also easily. You have lots of blocks, which means that you need to have a very large tag store in your cache. Then the question is, where do you put those tags? You can put them uh, in your memory controller, but now your tag store becomes on the order of megabytes and megabytes, right? You could as well have a cache instead of, you could as well use, that, use those megabytes for something useful as opposed to a tax store, right? More useful, let's say, because tax store is potentially useful as well, right? Because you're keeping track of something. But you could store data in that. So that's the trade-off, basically. Uh, that, that people have actually spent a lot of uh, effort into understanding uh, how to build these DRM caches. Uh, I'll give you some ideas here, but if you're interested, you can read some of the papers that I'm going to reference but not talk about in detail. Basically, this is the problem. A large DRM cache requires a large, requires a large metadata store, tag store, and also tag store is not just a tag store in this case. Uh, it's also maybe some prediction information that you want uh, to keep uh, in each block, uh, whether you're going to access this block again, for example. Basically, some sort of information about what is the behavior of uh, the block so that you can decide where to put the block. Right? Then, of course, the question is how do we design an efficient DRAM cache in this case? So this is the scenario that we're going to look at very briefly. So we get a load uh, coming from the CPU. It misses in all of the CPU caches. It hits the memory controller. And the memory controller needs to make the decision of where is this, uh, where is this uh, uh, load? Like, where, where is the data that's requested by this load? So you need to have some sort of metadata somewhere, or tag store, that says X is in DRAM. If X is in DRAM, then you access X from the DRAM, right? And then you bring it to the CPU caches. But if X is not in DRAM, then you need to access PCI. Okay, that's the idea, basically. So as I said, one option is to really store the uh, tag store inside the memory controller and have a huge tag store. Uh, that leads to a very large SRAM store. And that, I think, is impractical if, if the size of your DRAM is very large. If the size of your DRAM is relatively small, maybe that's practical, fine. But if the size of your DRAM is very large, it becomes impractical. It also has another issue. If, your, if the size of your DRAM can grow in the future, you need to size your tag store to be uh, the worst case size that you expect. Right? This is very similar to the issue that we had with the Raider. If you remember the first lecture, memory refresh lecture, we talked about Raider. And we didn't want to put a fixed size table into the memory controller to keep track of which rows need to be refreshed uh, more frequently. Right? Because if you actually take out your DRAM and plug in a bigger DRAM, your table size needs to be larger also. So you need to provision for the maximum possible memory size that you have uh, in this table that you put into the memory controller. Similar issue exists here. Because that was metadata. That's a different type of metadata, which is really how often you should refresh each row. This is another metadata that says, where is the row or where is the cache block that, you're, uh, that you have, uh, uh, that you're accessing. OK, so uh, that's going to be practical. I'm going to show you some results very quickly that, that leads to not so uh, good energy efficiency. OK, so what's the idea? Then uh, one idea is really to store the tag store inside the DRAM itself. Uh, and a lot of designs actually do that today. 
but I believe there are better designs going into the future. So the scenario of active research. Uh, uh, basically, you don't, just, you don't just store data, meaning cache blocks inside DM, because DM is your cache now, but you also store the tags associated with those cache blocks. Let's take a look at a DM row. This is the row that you, uh, you know very well by now. You store the tags uh, of the cache blocks in the same row as the data. That's the idea. And this way, your data and metadata can be accessed together. Right. So whenever you want to access a row, you basically index uh, the, uh, the cache uh, that contains uh, the thing that you're asking for, index the row that, you, that contains the thing that you're asking for, and you check for a tag match. If the tag matches, then the block is there. So you get a row hit in the data access. That's the idea. So the big benefit of this is now you don't need to store any tags on chip. All of your tags are part of your DRAM cache itself. DRAM cache is not just a data store, it's also a tag store and data store. But of course there are downsides, right? Now, in order to determine whether or not you hit in the DRAM cache, you need to access DRAM at least once, right? To get the tag that you're looking for. And a cache hit requires two, at least two DRAM accesses. I say at least two because this depends on the size of your tags, right? If you have a huge tag and if you have a very widely associated cache, you may need to bring in uh, a larger chunk than a cat. Uh, uh, basically, then uh, that, uh, you may need to bring in tags uh, that that occupy a larger chunk than uh, the granularity of your DRAM access. That's the idea. But even even a single DRAM access is not good because if you get a miss in DRAM, you've accessed DRAM already, and the DRAM tells you you get a miss. Now you go to go and access phase change memory, the other memory. So you lengthen your critical path by a lot. So. Okay, uh, this may not be that, that great design. Basically, getting rid of all of the on-chip tag storage may not be a great design in the end. So what's the idea? Any guesses? How do you actually, how can you actually reduce the uh, latency of a tag match or tag mismatch? Tag access, let's say. Anyone? Basically, how, how do you not access the app? You put some metadata back into the chip, right? <laughs> but we don't want to put all the metadata, so what do you put there? Well, the idea is caching. Basically, now you cache the tags. <laughs> so you have a cache, you need to build a tag store for it, and the tags are inside the cache, but it's too, too slow to access those tags, so what do you do? You cache the tags on chip. So it's, it, as I said, computer architecture is sometimes about caching architecture, cache architecture. So this is a perfect example of building a cache. Uh, this is, now you build a cache of tag store, a cache of the tag store. Basically, that's the idea. So store all metadata in DRAM to reduce the metadata storage overhead. That was a previous idea. But that leads to low latency access for the tags. But if you can cache in on-chip SRAM some frequently accessed metadata, uh, you can get away with caching only a small amount to keep the size of that SRAM small. Now you don't need megabytes and megabytes, maybe you need some kilobytes and kilobytes, according to the paper that I'm going to briefly show you results from. Uh, that's, that's what you get. So of course, on top of this, you could potentially predict the access patterns and prefetch your tags, right? Actually, later works uh, building on what I'm going to show you, shown that you could prefetch your tags. If you have good spatial locality, you could keep prefetching your tags. Yes? Um, imagine that you have this 8 gigabyte DRAM as your cache, and imagine that this is directly mapped. Yes. So how likely is it to have an addiction? I mean, unless your your like program memory footprint is too huge, mm -hmm. but it moves from different directly mapped chunks of that PCO thing, mm -hmm. it's not that likely to have like an addiction concept, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> what asking. It's, uh, I mean, in the end, it's a, it's a big cache. It really depends on the characteristics of your program. So basically, the answer to your question is it depends. Yeah, that's right. but like what <laughs> which, which is the answer to many questions in yeah. computer architecture. Yeah. yeah. Like what I was thinking was that maybe you don't need to keep the tag for yeah. every single one of your Like, if you know that you're, you're accessing from this 8 gigabyte chunk of the memory, uh -huh. you can cache it and you can just keep like the tag for this chunk. You know, You don't need to keep the tag for every different directly map chunk there. So that if you have evictions, you need to change the type. You can't just say, I start from here, and I have this 8 gigabytes, and I'm just I see. Catching. So basically, what the, I guess what you're saying is you really uh, uh, ca you really have a very large block. I think that's what you're suggesting, right? 
If you have a very large block, certainly your tag overhead reduces. But I think uh, studies show that those large blocks are not very uh, effective. You still need some sort of small granularity over there. I'll show you some results. Even cache block granularity actually helps because programs, uh, I mean, that for various reasons, you, you don't get consecutive allocation in your physical memory of eight gigabyte chunks. Oh, okay. if, if you get that consecutive allocation, then what you suggest may work if you keep all of your data in that consecutive thing. But if you think about a system running many, many programs, oh, yeah. your physical memory gets allocated, deallocated, allocated, deallocated. And you don't, you basically, a program's, uh, physical memories, a program's physical memory allocation spread around all of your physical memory. Yeah. Yeah. If you somehow find a way of this contiguous memory allocation, maybe your idea could work. But that requires very careful system design, I think. And it may not be possible in the end. Okay, but I think you point out a good thing. If, if you can keep your tag store size small, if it's possible to do that, you don't have this problem. And I think you had another implicit thing over there, which is a direct map cache versus a set associative cache. If you have a direct map cache, this problem becomes easier, of course, uh, because now you don't need to store many, many tags in a single row. And people have proposed having direct map cache for various reasons, so that you don't need to access DRAM multiple times to, get a, uh, to make a decision of hit or miss. But again, people also showed that set associative caches are better than direct map caches uh, in, in this context also. Okay. Okay, good. Basically, this is the idea. Uh, so, and this is the idea relatively simple, right? You cache the DRAM tags. Uh, now, I think it, it's also good for you to question. Uh, this, is, this is all from a processor-centric view again. We're, we're not talking about processing in memory. If you think about processing in memory, maybe you get rid of a lot of these overheads as well. Right? Keep that in mind all of these caching hierarchies and uh, uh, caching that you build into the tax store itself is really, in my opinion, is based on a processor-centric design, all of the prefetching mechanisms that you add. If you actually have computation capability right inside this and right inside this, maybe you have a different issue. You may still need to migrate data once in a while between them because sometimes you may want to do computation over here, but then some part of the data is over here, right? Or you may distribute the computation across this memory. But you may not have this problem of uh, uh, keeping caches of caches and caches of tax stores. Right? Okay. Okay, the third idea is actually orthogonal. Uh, as I said, uh, data transfer granularity is important. Uh, some applications benefit from caching more data in a cache block, like potentially 8 gigabytes. I have not seen that, but. Uh, or well, certainly 4 kilobytes or 8 kilobytes. Uh, they have good spatial locality because of that reason. Uh, but others do not also. Uh, they be, basically, if you have very large granularity, it wastes bandwidth and reduces cache utilization. So if you actually uh, are accessing, let's say, only four bytes or 16 bytes in a block, having a four kilobyte block is not very useful, of course, right? It wastes a lot of bandwidth. So the idea in this work that I'm going to show you results from is to have a simple dynamic caching granularity policy. The idea is basically very simple. Sample which granularity is working well and follow that granularity for a given application. Of course, there's some complexity associated with it, uh, but you can read the paper for more detail. So there's some cost-benefit analysis that, that you need to determine to, uh, that you need to do to determine the best DRAM cache block size for a given application. And the way it's done in this work is you group main memory sets into rows and you basically look at the miss rate that you get uh, in the different rows. It's not just a miss rate, it's actually more than that latency that you're getting. Uh, some, basically some sample row sets that uh, follow different fixed caching granularities and the rest of main memory follows the best granularity that you determine based on these sampled sets. This is called set sampling or set dueling. We discussed that briefly in one of the lectures. Briefly though. Uh, and it, it works uh, in, in general. But of course, if you have completely random access, it may not work very well. Okay, so that's the idea. I'm not going to go through the details of it. But uh, okay, what is the bottom line? So if you do all of the optimizations that we discussed, this is, um, this is from this paper over here. Uh, this is performance. Uh, one is, this, it's normalized to an SRAM tag store. All of your tags are an SRAM in the memory controller. This is basically the perfect tag store. Whenever you need to uh, access your cache, you, act, you, you can access your tag store in, let's say, one cycle very quickly. You don't need to go to the app layer. Uh, and these are different options for dealing with your tags. Uh, actually, the last one is dealing with your data granularity, so it's orthogonal. But this one, for example, this is not something that I discussed, actually. Uh, this is Okay, this is something we discussed, tags in memory. The design where you have the tags and data in the same row. 
But there's also a, a, a not, a, not, a good, not as good of a design, which is you store your tags and data separately in the app, right? Maybe tags are in one bank and data is in some other bank. Right? Now, if you do that, you don't get, whenever you get a tag, hit, tag match, you don't get a row hit uh, for the data access. You need to access some other bank for the data. So it turns out that's why it's not very good. As you can see, it's much lower than the performance is almost half of having all the uh, tags inside s -trap. So this makes a big difference, as you can see, how you deal with your tag store. Now, if you put your tags and data in the same row, you actually recover quite a bit of performance. If you actually cache the tags based on frequency, you actually recover even more performance. So now we're getting closer to the performance of a fully SJAM tag store, as you can see. Of course, uh, later works, uh, this work doesn't do that, but later works actually added prefetching mechanisms into the tag store. Basically, you, you prefetch the tags into the tag cache uh, in the memory controller, and you can actually get very close to uh, this over here. That's the idea. But of course, that depends on your workload behavior as well. Right? This is, these are average results across the workloads that are exact. And dynamic caching granularity actually gives you a little bit more, as you can see over here, uh, at, the, at the cost of more complexity. Still, the results are not as good as uh, having an SRAM tag cache, as you can see. Okay, but the energy results look uh, better in the sense that uh, you can see this is the baseline, and these are the progressively better tag me me mechanisms. Now, if you actually put a tag cache uh, inside your memory controller, you get significant energy efficiency boost, but that's still not good enough, actually, uh, to, uh, to be as good as uh, having a tag store inside SRAM over here. But if you actually fix your migration granularity and make it dynamic, uh, you, get a lot, uh, you get a much larger boost from there in terms of energy efficiency. Because for applications that do not benefit from very large block sizes, you're actually getting rid of those large block sizes uh, with that optimization, meaning that you're getting rid of a lot of memory bandwidth. And whenever you're reducing memory bandwidth, while also improving performance according to these results, you will get significant boosts in energy efficiency. OK, make sense? Okay, so if you're interested, this is a short four-page paper. You can read about it. And there's been a lot of work uh, after this, uh, which I'm not going to talk about. This is based on a paper that we recently written with Intel. I'm not going to talk about the paper itself. Very briefly, I will cover it. But you can see that these are some of the works that we compared to in that paper. And they were all proposed within the, uh, frame, uh, within the time frame of 2015 to 2017, let's say. And they all differ in terms of how they handle a DRM cache hit, how they handle a DRM cache miss, how they handle uh, the replacement traffic, when do they make a replacement decision, who makes the replacement decision, hardware, software. Do they uh, help with large pages, for example, if your pages are one megabyte or two megabyte sizes, do they consider it? You can actually add more to it. There are a lot of design choices that you need to make when you're designing such a large ca cache. But I would like to point out that some of the design choices are software managed, for example. Some of them actually don't do the management in hardware. Uh, they do uh, software management uh, over here, as you can see. So the, this work that I copied this from uh, has a hardware-software cooperative management mechanism. Basically, uh, it realizes that uh, you, you actually have a TLB and a page table that keeps track of which pages are in physical memory. Right. That's, that's what uh, the operating system uses. Uh, to keep track of which pages are in physical memory. And you can attach a little bit more information to the page table and the TLB saying that whether or not that page is actually in the DRAM cache. That's the idea over here. Very basic idea. This way, you don't need a tag store for the DRAM cache or uh, at, least a hard, uh, at least a hardware tag store in the memory controller. Basically, you put your tag store as part of your page table. You extend your page table slightly and you extend your TLB slightly, but that's the idea. But of course, now uh, your, uh, your caching uh, information, your tag information is your TLB. Right? The TLB, whenever you do a load access in the processor itself, uh, you, you also figure out whether that load is cached in uh, DRAM or you need to access PCM, for example. Now the, uh, this information becomes a little bit uh, hard to maintain consistent. Uh, so if, you, if, if you're, if all of your information is your memory controller, that memory controller can maintain uh, is, the, is the only place. But if your information is in TLB, uh, what happens to pay if when the page gets deallocated from your DRAM cache, for example? Somebody needs to make that decision. 
And once that, uh, once that uh, cash uh, page, for example, gets deallocated, you need to ensure that the TLBs that recorded that page as being in the DRAM cache should be kept coherent, meaning that you need to send a signal to all of the TLBs saying that they should invalidate uh, that particular page from the TLB itself. That's the idea. We'll talk about coherence in the next lectures. But this kind of a foreshadowing, right? if you keep information in your TLBs that are shared, you need to keep it consistent across different processes. Okay, there's also some more other stuff. So th there's a lot of work actually that looks at how do we actually keep the right stuff in the cache. And this paper introduces yet another mechanism that tries to minimize the bandwidth uh, by trying to be very frugal in terms of, or, or judicious about what to cache. And you can read about that also. And you can see some performance results also. Basically, these are the speed ups that you get compared to the state of the art, and it does well. Then you can read the paper for more detail. There, there are more works after this also, but I want to point this out because it's some work that we've done with Intel. Uh, okay, any questions? Yes, please. So this works actually, actually there are multiple granularities, but the main granularity is the uh, 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 page granularity. So if your page granularity is 4K, yes. If your page granularity is 8K, yes. But it does handle the large pages also. So if you want to go to a smaller granularity, you need to add more metadata to this, pro uh, to this. And it becomes a little bit less efficient actually, you're right. Any other questions? That's a very good question. Granularity is always a very good question here. And as, you as I said last time, as you reduce the granularity of your tracking, your metadata increases. As you increase the granularity of your tracking, your metadata reduces, as you also mentioned. Okay, so if there are no questions, let's talk about some other opportunities with emerging memory technologies. So this is a bit more forward looking, I think. Uh, I'm going to talk about especially this one, merging of memory and storage. Basically, you have a memory technology that's non-volatile, you can store persistent data in it, you can store data that can be volatile in it also. So why don't we have a single interface to manage all of the data, as opposed to having two different interfaces, as we will see in all of it. Uh, and you've been going through two different interfaces to manage data in all of your programming languages in your life. That was not the case 50 or 60 years ago when people designed the earliest computers because there was again a single interface to all of the data at that time. But things have evolved in a different way. That's why we have multiple interfaces today. Okay, so that's one. New applications, of course, is important. Uh, in fact, if you want to enable a technology like this, having a really killer application is always something that people are looking for. What is the most important application that can benefit from this technology? That's actually true for any new, memory, any new technology that you come up with. You need to have a good application. For example, machine learning turned out to be a great application for GPUs. And GPUs actually skyrocketed uh, because of machine learning. Although people are realizing that you could do better than GPUs right now, right? By designing specialized accelerators. Uh, so similarly, uh, if you have new applications like that, these technologies can be enabled and they can skyrocket. Uh, more robust system design, can you actually make your system more robust by taking advantage of the fact that your persistent data stays on you don't have power, lo uh, it, despite power losses. I think this is important. I'm going to touch upon some things related to this, but we're not going to talk about that as much. And finally, processing in memory actually becomes very interesting with some of these memory technologies. Again, I'm not going to touch upon this, so I'll probably point out some papers later on. Uh, but basically, uh, these technologies store persistent data. You can actually directly operate on persistent data with processing in memory. That's one aspect of it. You don't need to put it in your DRAM or anywhere. Uh, the second aspect of it is, it turns out some of, a lot of these technologies have properties that are similar to the ambit idea that we discussed, right? If you do a triple row of activation, you get bitwise and and or. It's not exactly the same way, uh, but if you do something to memory, maybe multiple row of activation or some other ways of uh, activating the different cells, you get bitwise operations in these memories relatively easily. Actually, you can design the array such that you can do multiplication in the array. Uh, in, in, for example, RAM. You could design a multiplier inside the memory uh, by exploiting the properties of the memory technology. I think that's also very fascinating, and people are working on it. And if you have time, we will uh, later during the course, we may actually have a special session on this one. But, uh, and this is actually uh, going to be very, very important, I think, going into the future. But I'm going to talk about something that we have not talked about so far, which is really this one. But I think all of these are very interesting. Okay, so let's, th let's, let's start with this one. Basically, uh, as I said, we, uh, today we've been programming with two-level storage models. Right? Uh, 
essentially you are uh, you have oh, you have DRAM over here which stores your volatile data and you have a hard disk over here which stores your uh, persistent or non-volatile data let's say and this is because the technologies are very separate from each other if you look at the hard disk or SSD technologies they're non-volatile they're slow and they're block addressable basically whenever you access you get a huge chunk if you look at the DRAM itself as we've seen it's volatile it's but it's fast and it's byte addressable you get one byte at a time basically your granularity is really a byte or whatever granularity that your DRAM provides right which is much smaller than 512 bytes or 4 kilobytes today so clearly there's a huge disparity between these two different technologies and because of that disparity people have developed two different let's call them programming models they're really programming interfaces here you operate directly with your data structures you do a load, you do a store in your data structures. Here, you have to go through a file system. Right? And the file system handles everything for you. Uh, but uh, if you have non-volatile memory, you're actually somewhere in between. Right? Uh, it's combi uh, they combine characteristics of both memory and storage. They're fast, they're byte addressable, and they're non-volatile. Right? Maybe not as fast as DM, that's the downside, of course. Right? The question is, can you actually use this as a single uh, I don't want to call it not, not necessarily a single device, but can you actually use this, uh, th these characteristics to build a single interface to access all of the data? That's the idea. So let me show you another way of thinking about it. Basically, we have a traditional two-level storage model and it becomes a bottleneck uh, with these new technologies. So we have, today we store volatile data in memory and access with a load store interface and persistent data in storage, we access with a file system interface. So if you look over here, accessing main memory is very fast. In fact, there's a lot of hardware support for this. Because this device is extremely fast, people add a lot of hardware support, like the virtual memory subsystem, to minimize the latency of access to this particular memory. Well, if you look over here, this device is traditionally very, very slow. And let's say on the order of milliseconds, right? So uh, people decided that well, you go through some software interface, and that interface and it gives you a lot of good characteristics, of course, in terms of security, for example, or isolation. But it, it's also slow. Basically, whenever you need to open a file, you need to go through the operating system. Whenever you need to write to a file, you need to go through a write uh, system call. Uh, of course, even that is sometimes slow. So what, 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 what existing systems do is they sometimes copy uh, pages of your file into the DRAM itself and they do that management and whenever you write to a file you write in DRAM and there's system level support to ensure that the writes that you do to volatile memory eventually get propagated into your disk. This is one of the reasons if you get a power outage for example not all of your writes to your files may be propagated into your SSD. right? Because some of the persistent data updates may be buffered in volatile memory and if the system doesn't have enough time to write it back to the SSD in time, you may actually get a corrupt file system potentially. Right? That's why these things happen. Actually, this, these things happen more before you had SSDs. If you had a very slow hard disk, the probability of you not being able to uh, uh, put the data that's really supposed to be persistent, that's buffered in this volatile memory, back into the storage is uh, 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 much lower right? compared to having an SSD that's much faster. Okay, so basically, but, but what people have done is essentially you go through these operating system and file system interface which takes microseconds, let's say, if, hopefully not milliseconds, but microseconds. It's, it may be okay, right? You're accessing this device and that device is slow. Who cares if you spend some more microseconds if the device is spending milliseconds? That's why the interface is like that. But as I said, people try to still get performance by buffering this because they have no other choice, right? They have this slow memory technology, they cannot directly write to it, so they have to buffer the data that's supposed to be persistent inside volatile memory and update it, manipulate it over here. Of course, this requires a lot of bookkeeping in the operating system to say, okay, I have this file currently that I've opened, and this block of this file that resides over here somewhere in the storage is mapped to main memory right now. And Whenever uh, I write to this main memory, I'm actually writing to this file, and eventually I need to propagate those updates back into the persistent storage because these are supposed to be persistent writes. They're done through the file system write system call. So there is a lot of overhead actually to keep track of this, basically. Uh, now that overhead actually becomes much worse if this is a fast 
non-volatile memory. So if this becomes phase change memory, and if we keep the same software stack, not a good idea, because now this is nanoseconds, like the UN, and you're, you're, you're spending microseconds over here. That's a very different trade-off. You don't want to have a device expensive, reasonably expensive, that you can really access in nanoseconds, but you're really wasting microseconds to actually access that device. That makes no sense, basically. So basically, uh, this becomes a bottleneck. The operating system and file system code to open the files, to actually uh, locate the files, to translate the files so that they get mapped to the main memory, to buffer the data in main memory, and to basically ensure that this data stays persistent whenever you do writes to the file, become performance energy bottlenecks with these very fast non volatile memory stores. Of course, the question is how do you actually uh, fix the problem? Uh, actually, people, this is not a new problem necessarily, but this problem becomes exacerbated if your device is extremely fast, like phase change memory. So there's a lot of work, uh, as I said, earlier systems like Atlas Computer, there was no really big distinction, uh, there was no distinction actually, it was a single level store, meaning that there was no distinction between these two uh, things. All of your memory was persistent, and you could actually directly update it with some mechanisms. A lot, a lot of it was slow actually, in the end. But over time, DRAM became much faster, and this became not so fast, and there was this dichotomy between them. As a result, people had developed two different programming interfaces for them. Now the question is, of course, should we still have two different programming interfaces for them? If you're really interested in the bottlenecks that are caused by uh, these this two different interfaces, uh, there's a beautiful book uh, by a, an IBM engineer, Frank Soltes Jr. Uh, he, he wrote this book in 1982, I think. Uh, and the book is about the AS400 system, I, one of IBM's mainframes. It's called Inside the AS400. It's written beautifully. It's a really beautiful writing. It's, it doesn't just talk about the software, it talks about all of the aspects of how they developed the AS400, how they made the design decisions. And this is one of the things they talk, it, 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 it talks about. They said, uh, he, said, uh, he says in the book basically, it's too much overhead to basically move data between, we, we, we designed the system to deal with a lot of files. But it's too much overhead to actually move the data between the file system over here to main memory and basically you need to do three types of buffering to be able to do that to ensure that you don't actually lose data in the end. And that three types of buffering actually adds a lot of overhead into the system but we, we decided to actually have a single level store in the system. So single level store meaning is, is basically having a single interface. And then he goes and talks about how, yeah, how they actually designed the system. Of course, when they actually did this, there, were n there was no such fast persistent memory. So the system in the end was relatively slow. But now we have this persistent memories, can we actually revisit the idea of single level stores? That's the idea. And people are actually revisiting the idea of single level stores today. Uh, people are actually designing file systems to be much more efficient, getting rid of a lot of the overheads. But even then they're also finding out that there's not enough. So they're actually uh, thinking of adding loads and stores that directly operate on persistent data. So what's a single level store? Basically it's a unified memory and storage management uh, unit, let's say. Uh, we would like to unify uh, the, store, uh, the management of both memory and storage in a single unit to eliminate all of that wasted work to locate, transfer, and translate data. So from the programmer's perspective, you're really doing loads and stores, and also perhaps specifying the persistence properties of the data, right? Because if you're accessing volatile data, you can actually, uh, you have a lot of freedom uh, in the data. But if you're accessing persistent data, if you're updating it, then you need to ensure that those updates get propagated, otherwise you will lose the data. Right? So you need to really specify the properties of it. And perhaps you get some feedback from the system. Essentially, that's, what, uh, that's the idea. From the programmer's perspective, it's very simple. So the hope is that this hopefully improves both energy and performance, as I will show you in a little bit, actually. It does improve energy and performance significantly compared to this model and when you use persistent memories, of course. Uh, and also it simplifies the programming model, in my opinion. In the end, you just need to get used to having a programming model where you update the persistent data with your loads and stores. So all of, us, all of you are probably used to uh, uh, doing file system calls, right? Okay. Has anyone programmed with a persistent load and store? Not yet, but it's maybe coming. Okay, so uh, that's the idea basically. So let's take a look at how uh, we can, so this is the paper that uh, we had written actually. It's more like a position paper that talks about the challenges related to cooperative management of storage and memory. Okay, so I, I think we've already talked about that. Basically, uh, the persistent memory provides an opportunity to manipulate persistent data directly. So how do you manipulate persistent data directly? 
One way is this. This changes the programming model a bit. Basically, you have a persistent uh, a pro programming model that incorporates persistent data as a citizen, let's say, one of the data types. So for example, uh, this could be a persistent object. So you, uh, you, have an, you have an array, my data, and you declare it persistent in some way. This is one way of declaring it persistent. Maybe it's not the best way. You, have, you may actually say persistent. Right? Uh, and then you update uh, the, the, the values. And the value update happens immediately, let's say, from the programmer's perspective. There may be system support internally, of course, uh, to ensure that that really happens. And then underlying store may be very different. right? Underlying storage hierarchy, you basically use loads and stores, and you pro probably provide hints or directives saying that this is persistent. Uh, and this could get communicated to a person memory manager that does a lot of things. It handles data layout, persistent, metadata management, security, uh, because a lot of those are actually handled by the uh, file systems today. File systems ensure that uh, you don't get uh, data corruption, or try to ensure that you don't get data corruption because because of multiple updates to the same file, right? Uh, so you need to do all of that also in that inside this person memory manager, except you need to deal with loads and stores. And underlying memory hierarchy can be, not necessarily hierarchy, but memory devices can be very heterogeneous. You may have DRAM, you may have NVM, you may have flash, you may have magnetic disk, you may have tape over here. So that's the idea. Wouldn't it be nice to have a single interface load store over here? And I think uh, the best way of doing it is in the end changing the programming model. But of course, you could translate the existing file system calls to loads and stores as well. Right? This is what's happening in some uh, file systems that are, uh, Intel has some, has some of the file systems that are persistent, let's say. They actually translate those file system uh, directives into loads and stores. There's some overhead associated with it, but they try to get rid of as much overhead as possible because of the software stack uh, management. So that's another way, basically. You have a, an existing program, you translate it to loads and stores somehow, and then you go through a person memory manager. So what does this person memory manager do? We're going to talk about this briefly. Uh, a lot, actually. Basically, it uses this access and hint information to allocate, locate, migrate, and access data in the heterogeneous array of the devices that you have. The, all of the goal is really to take advantage of the low latency persistent characteristics of this NVM. Because the hope is that this is huge. Right? This NVM is huge, it's low latency, it's persistent. It basically is very close to DRAM in terms of its access latency. But uh, the idea is more general. The idea is whatever data you have, why don't we access it with loads and stores? Why do we need to have all of this overhead, especially most of our data is going to hit in the NVM? Okay, so let's uh, talk about this briefly. Basically, we want to expose a load store interface to pers access person data. This way, applications don't need to go through the operating system or file system. They can directly access persistent memory. As a result, there is no conversion, translation, location overheads for persistent data. You can manipulate persistent data directly. With some caveats, actually. We will see those caveats in a little bit. Uh, uh, you need to manage data placement. Uh, the, the person memory manager manages the data placement, location, person, and security. You can read the paper for more detail of this. I'm going to give you a brief example. Basically, the idea is to get the best more multiple forms of storage. This is, this is the same idea as a heterogeneous memory system, right? So you can actually apply a lot of the things that we've discussed over here, but there needs to be more. Uh, you need to manage metadata as storage and retrieval. The part of the metadata is DRAM cache, for example. And as we said, this can lead to overheads that need to be managed. But it's not just the DRAM cache. It's also, OK, now you have this persistent array. Where does it reside, right? Does it reside? Which part of it resides in DRAM? Which part of it? This is essentially a memory management system uh, for this kind of vision, if you will. Right? Today, we have virtual memory managing DRAM and disk. Why don't we actually have a virtual memory, I don't want to call it virtual memory necessarily, but memory management system, let's say, for all of your uh, devices. And again, this is just a single node. You could imagine doing this for a distributed program as well. Right? Today, if you want to communicate with some other device, you need to go through a different, even different interface. Right? You need to either do network programming, or you need to do remote direct memory access, which is a form of load and store, but it's a remote load and remote store. Why don't we have load and store and a globally visible memory for everyone in the world? You can imagine having this interface for all of the data in the world. We're clearly far away from there because we clearly don't have it even in a single node. But there's no reason to not imagine that you could extend this idea very much more broadly. Okay. But of course, if you extend the idea broadly, then you need to, uh, this becomes an even bigger problem, like right? metadata storage and 
And of course, on, uh, on top of this, we expose hooks and interface for system software and perhaps the applications to enable better data placement and management decisions. Any questions? This is a lot, actually. This slide covers a lot of stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of research that needs to be done to really make this happen. But part of it is being done right now. Uh, so, okay, let me give you an example. Uh, how do you do efficient data mapping among heterogeneous devices? Uh, essentially, uh, we expose a large persistent address space with persistent memory, but it may use different devices to satisfy this particular goal, right? You don't need to use uh, phase change memory. You can use tape, maybe, right? If you know your data characteristics, you don't need to waste your valuable uh, phase change memory space if you could store the data in tape. So for example, uh, well, I've already given you examples over here. So you could have other MEM devices in between as well. And performance and energy can benefit from good placement of data among these devices. I've given you some examples of this earlier. Uh, and utilizing the strengths of each device and avoiding their weaknesses, of course. For example, let's take a look at locality and persistence. These are two different characteristics of data. Locality we know very well. Persistence we have not talked about as much. But uh, depending on your application, you may know which data, or which arrays, for example, or which uh, data structures uh, are, uh, fit where in this. So for example, uh, let's pick one. Uh, if, you, if you're working on a database, you have a column, and you have a column store database, and you're basically scanning your database through these columns. And maybe you're not accessing these frequently. Uh, or maybe the data set size is so huge that you're going through the column and you don't have good locality uh, in the end to keep it in one of your devices. Maybe you place that on flash so that you can do the scan very efficiently in flash memory. Right? You could potentially do that actually. Of course, if you, we're not even talking about processing in memory. If you're doing that sort of scan on a column, maybe it's a good idea actually to push that scan into the flash device itself. Right? We're not even talking about that yet. Uh, but even if you do it through the processor, maybe it's good to keep this on flash. Or, uh, but if you have a much more uh, frequently updated index for some sort of content delivery network, for example, this doesn't need to be persistent. This needs to be persistent. I didn't talk about that actually, but this needs to be persistent because it's part of your database, right? You need to retain the data over there. This doesn't need to be persistent. You, re you can reconstruct the content because this is really just an index for the content, right? So you can actually, but, but, it, uh, but you have very good locality, so maybe you place this in DR. Right? So you can actually come up with many, many examples like this. If you know your application, if you know what you're doing to your data structure, you can actually place uh, them in different places over here. And these are just two dimensions, right? Locality and persistence. Clearly, based on this, application or system software can provide hints for data placement. Now let's take a look at uh, how we can do this data. Uh, I'm not going to go through this in more detail, but I'm going to give you some basic results uh, that show that actually if you get rid of the overheads of persistent, uh, of overheads of file system, you get significant benefits. So we're going to look at some storage intensive applications. The paper contains all of the applications. These are actually applications that access file systems a lot. It's, they're, they're different from the applications that actually we've, we've looked at in a lot of this part of the course. They're much more data intensive. Uh, so we're going to evaluate three different baselines, uh, well, three ba two baselines and one persistent memory future uh, uh, imagination, let's say. If you remember the simulation lecture, right? We can imagine and we can simulate. That's what this is about. So basically, this is a traditional hard disk baseline. Uh, you have wall to DRAM and you have persistent data stored in hard disk. Clearly, uh, you, need, you, you need to go, th go through two different interfaces for this. Uh, and overheads of operating system and file system code and buffering are over there. The NVM baseline, this is the same as this hard disk baseline, but the hard disk is replaced with NVM in this case. Basically, you magically replace the hard disk with phase change memory-like device. Uh, much similar characteristics to DRAM, but you still go through two different interfaces. So it still has the uh, operating system and file system overheads of the two-level storage model. On the, uh, uh, finally, the persistent memory, it uses only NVM. Uh, to ensure full system persistence. And in, in this case, actually, we wanted to penalize the system. We actually get rid of the DRAM in the system. In a real system, I don't think you would get rid of DRAM, but we wanted to understand, what if you just had phase change memory like NVM, and uh, you only use that, you don't have DRAM, all, access, all data is accessed using loads and stores, and we don't waste time on system calls in this case, because we have a persistent memory manager that does all of that for you. That's the idea. Of course, there could be another one over here that incorporates DRAM. Its performance would be higher because you have a hybrid memory uh, in that case. Right? 
So basically, here data is manipulated directly on the uh, MEM device. So I'm going to show you some results. You can read the paper for more detail, but this is one, uh, one application. I don't remember which one actually right now. I used to remember, uh, but you can look at the paper. Uh, basically, these are the, this is the performance that you get, normalized execution time, on these three different uh, systems. This is the system with hard disk. Because it's a very storage intensive application, most of the time in the hard disk baseline is spent on accessing the hard disk. Basically, this is the hard disk access. Very little amount of the time is really spent on the CPU. This is an example of the data bottleneck, as we discussed last time, right? Maybe an extreme example. But if your data is very large, and if you need to get a lot of your data from the hard disk, you're spending a lot of your time in the end on accessing the hard disk. Now, if you replace that hard disk with something like phase change memory, which is like 4x slower, let's say, than DRAM in terms of reads, and 12x slower than DRAM in terms of writes, you get a huge performance boost in this application. That's 24x, right off the bat. Even with a two-level storage model, you still uh, uh, go through the file system to access uh, the persistent data uh, in, in your PCM. But this is the benefit of a new technology, as you can see. Of course, you can say that it's not fair because this is a magnetic hard disk, and you're right. We should really compare it to an SSD here, right? But if you do that comparison, SSD is somewhere over here. So SSD is actually quite good. And that's why they replaced the hard disk in many devices, as you can see. But going from SSD to NVM, you still have a large gap, basically. Okay, but that's not necessarily the point of the paper. The point is here, even if you look at this system, you're wasting a lot of performance. Basically, most of the time, uh, at least a good chunk of the time is spent on not, that, not just the MEM access, but also uh, uh, really the system calls that you need to do to do the MEM access. So if you actually get rid of those system calls, you get about 5x more. Basically, if you get rid of the overhead of managing, uh, so going from here to here, there are two things that happen. You get, o you get rid of the software overhead, meaning the system file system and operating system calls to manipulate persistent data, and you also get rid of DRAM. So getting rid of the file system and system call overhead clearly gives you performance. Getting rid of DRAM loses performance. But in the end, you get a 5x performance improvement going from here to here. So you can see that getting rid of that overhead to manage a very fast device is very, very important. Because we actually have an overall slower memory here because we got rid of DRAM. But we got rid of a lot of overhead of managing that memory. That's the idea. Now, if you on top of this add DRAM, you will get a lot more performance. I, I, I mean, we don't have the results over here, but later papers looked at this idea. And you get actually much better performance than NVM2 level. Uh, and, uh, well, but you, you actually improve this to 10x or even more. I don't want to quote the exact numbers because I don't know the number for this particular benchmark. Does that make sense? So if you have a heterogeneous memory over here, DRAM plus NVM, you get a lot more. Okay, that's performance. And if you look at energy, basically you have a similar story. This is the energy uh, where you have hard disk plus DRAM. If you get rid of the hard disk, replace it with PCM, you get a significant energy reduction. And here the bottleneck again becomes the system calls and the management of uh, the NVM. If you actually get rid of uh, the bottleneck and also get rid of DRAM, which is actually energy efficient because uh, you, can, uh, you, you exploit locality and reduce latency, you get another 5x over here. Okay, so basically the takeaway is uh, if you have a fast device, don't have slow software to manage it. I think that's one of the takeaways. Actually, people figure this out with flash memory also. You, you may think flash memory is actually very fast, but the raw device access latency is much faster today uh, than, we can, uh, th than the latencies we use to access the uh, flash with. Because there's a lot of system software overhead, even with flash. If you do the study with flash, actually other people have done the study with flash, and they found out exactly the same thing. Flash is very fast. Of course, not as fast as NVM that we've been discussing, but it's very fast still compared to hard disk. But we're using the same interfaces we use uh, to manage hard we use to manage hard disk with, and that adds overhead. And if you actually get rid of that overhead and design a file system, especially for flash, then you get a lot better performance. I'd be happy to point you to some works in that area if you're interested. Okay. Any questions? Okay. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to move on to the next one. Basically. Uh, this is the paper that I actually talked about. This paper actually uh, talks about a lot of other problems uh, related to uh, how to enable 
persistent memory for both storage and memory. And this is also uh, another paper that I'm really happy about because I was able to get both Intel and AMD authors from that paper, as you can see. <laughs> I mean, this wasn't intentional, but somebody moved from Intel to, uh, to AMD, and that's, what, that's how this happened. <laughs> okay. So basically, the challenge and opportunity over here is really combined memory and storage. How do we enable that? And I think, of course, the bigger idea is really, uh, can we have a unified interface to all data? Uh, we talk about a single node, but as I said, the idea is actually really bigger than a single node. Like, can I, can I access your toaster at home with a single interface from this computer? You may not want that, of course. There are other issues related to that, but that's the idea right, in the end. Okay. So the good news is, that, as I said, these ideas uh, are experimentable, experimentable with devices that are like this today. So you can actually buy this thing. Uh, you have to pay an arm and a leg to Intel probably, but you can buy it and you can experiment with it. You can, you can do a lot of the studies that we discussed. We were not able to do them in 2000, actually we did that study in 2012. Clearly today it's 2019. Uh, and we have this device, and you can actually do these uh, studies on your own and figure out what are the potential benefits. You can come up with different interfaces to this, as, mo uh, as long as the hardware interface allows you, of course, right? So you need to understand the hardware interface to it, which is actually loads and stores in the end, which is, uh, which is similar to the DM and interface in the end. Okay, so but I think the potential is even larger if you combine this with something like this. Right, which is also what, I, what we discussed in the first lecture. Meaning, if you can do processing inside the memory uh, in, in these persistent memory chips, because then your persistent data doesn't even need to move anywhere. Right? And you can treat your data as persistent and volatile, depending on how the software would like to treat it. Right? Even though the device may be like this. Okay. Okay, clearly, uh, this is not the whole story, right? Meaning, you cannot as easily manipulate your persistent data because uh, you need to be careful about it. Whenever you update persistent data, you really are changing the system for good, right? Uh, so you need to be careful about it. What does this mean? There are a bunch of issues. One, uh, that some of them are discussed in the paper that I mentioned, but I'm going to discuss one other issue that we tackled over the course of time. And uh, that issue is how do you ensure consistency of the system and data if all of your memory is persistent? Imagine all of your memory is persistent. Uh, whenever you do an update, you really update the data persistently. Uh, then how do you actually uh, manage the consistency? I'm going to define the problem. There are two extremes of it, basically. So, okay, well, what does consistency mean? You get a system crash, let's say. That's the extreme. Software crash is another thing, potentially, but system crash, meaning that you get a power loss. Uh, and you updated part of your data. Uh, uh, normally, what should happen is you get a power loss, your system died, and then you restart your system, you should really be able to restart the system exactly at the point and continue, right, without any problems. But if you didn't do, uh, manipulate your persistent data right, what might happen is you get a power loss, you were manipulating a pointer-based structure, and that pointer-based structure is not completely updated, right? You manipulated something, but you didn't update the pointer yet. As a result, when the system comes back up, you go through and you manipulate the uh, structure, but you get an all pointer difference, which you should not have, for, for example, because you do, the, the data structure was not completely updated. I'm going to give you an example of this. How do you actually deal with that? Right. Uh, there are two extremes. Uh, one extreme is, uh, says programmer transparent, basically let the system handle it. Let the system give the illusion that you're updating your persistent data and the, syst the system crashes, and you don't need to do anything to ensure that the system comes back up without any problems and your software will work correctly. Right? So this is actually uh, uh, true for, like, you, uh, we have a lot of programs right now that are written assuming that DRAM is volatile, or maybe they're implicitly making this assumption. So they're manipulating data, they're manipulating all these data structures. Assume that they are ported magically to Intel's persistent memory directly. They're still doing their loads and stores, but the memory is not persistent. Whenever you get a system crash, uh, what happens is uh, your data is updated in some state. And you restart your system, you should be able to start from the point you got the crash on. So let the system handle it. That's one thing. The other thing is basically let the programmer handle it. That's the programming only approach. I think that's, a, that's another extreme. Basically, 
programmer needs to anticipate that a crash may happen anywhere in the program and they write their software such that they, could, they will not have inconsistent state in their data structures. That's the idea. And both approaches have been followed. Programmer only approaches say basically programmers need to encapsulate their updates and transactions. This is similar to some sort of storage transaction also but maybe bigger. <coughs> basically the things that you want uh, to uh, be done at the same time, like magically all or none, you encapsulate that into a transaction. And the system somehow guarantees that the transaction is either all done or none of it is done. Right. This is transactional memory in a sense, but that's true for transactional uh, persistence as well. There are slight differences we're not going to go into right now. Uh, but that's one way of dealing with it. Th then the program is handling it. Right? Of course, system needs to provide some support for this. Right? Uh, but it turns out this is not easy to do with legacy programs. If you have a legacy program and if you magically run it on a persistent memory system, it will not work because somebody needs to do the translation for those programs at least. So we follow the, actually the other extreme, which is can you do this completely programmer transparent? I'm not going to go into the details of it. I'm going to talk about the basic ideas. Uh, let the, basically let the system handle it. And if you do that, I think it's a very good exercise to do. I think the, uh, but the, it leads to a lot of overhead. Overhead in terms of hardware and system complexity. Here, the overhead in terms of, uh, on top, uh, for the programmer is very high, but the overhead for the system and hardware is not as high. Here, the overhead on the program is zero. Programmer doesn't need to do anything. But the overhead on the system designer and the hardware design is very high. And this is a classical example of programmer microarchitect or architect trade-off, basically. If you want to make programmer's life easier, you as an architect need to uh, have to go through some pain. Or you can reduce your pain by saying, programmer, you deal with it. Right? That's very similar. Virtual memory is also like this, basically. You may actually say, I don't want virtual memory because it, it puts a lot of burden on me as an architect. But if you don't want virtual memory, somebody needs to manage the physical memory, and that becomes a program. OK, so there are clearly many alternatives in between. I think the real life uh, will, uh, will do something in between. OK, so let's take a look at this problem. I'll go through the problem quickly, but not necessarily the solution in detail. So let's assume that we want to add a node to a linked list. Uh, this is what you do. You first link to next, and then you link to previous. But if you get a crash in between, you may actually have an inconsistent data structure. right? And if you're updating all of this in a persistent memory, you will not be able to recover. That's the idea. OK. So there are a lot of proposals, actually. You can read these uh, things. Uh, these are um, some proposals in the uh, different communities, as you can see. They propose explicit interface to manage this consistency problem. You can encapsulate, basically, things into a transaction. And this transaction is all or none. Basically, if you get a system crash in the, beginning of the, uh, in the middle of a transaction, it's as if the transaction didn't happen the guarantee of the system. The system provides that guarantee to you. If you get a system crash at the end of the transaction, the system guarantees that the transaction happens. So when you restart, you start either from the beginning or the end, but never inside the middle. But of course, if you really want to uh, burden the programmer, this limits adoption on MEM. Maybe in the long run, this is a good idea. But you now you need, to have, you need to rewrite your code with clear partition between volatile and non-volatile data. And people have actually shown that this is not easy also. It turns out uh, this is a burden on the programmers. There are a lot of tools that people are developing to help the programmers. What is volatile and what's non-volatile, right? Because sometimes volatile becomes non-volatile. You do some temporary manipulation on the data, and now you need to persist it on the disk or wherever. Then the boundary becomes more difficult. OK, so uh, uh, example code, for example, if you use one of these interfaces, it's an example interface. For example, if you're doing a hash table update, you need to basically specify different things as transactional updates. So this is a transactional update, and you need to declare the arguments in a special way, and you need to have a transactional function. Uh, so you need to manually declare the persistent components. You need to have a new implementation of different functions to ensure that they're consistent across crashes. And if you actually are using libraries, for example, this one, in this case it's made up, uh, this third-party code can be inconsistent. Uh, so you need to be careful with how do you, how do you deal with third-party code. So all of your third-party code needs to be actually uh, written the same way. This is actually a very similar problem uh, if you've done multi-threaded programming. There are functions that are safe for multi-threaded programming. There are functions that are not safe. You need to ensure that all of them are safe if you really want, don't want to get bugs. It's a very similar problem, basically. 
And there may be some operations that are prohibited because maybe you don't directly update your persistent memory. In fact, in all of the persistent memory systems, yeah, you do a store in the end, but you may need to buffer the value somewhere also because of this crash consistency problem. Because you do the store directly to memory, uh, persistent memory. If you actually do that directly and if you get a crash, you may actually end up in an inconsistent state. Some, uh, you usually buffer the value somewhere and then write the result back uh, into persistent memory when you know that the transaction is done. That's why it's a prohibited operation in this case. So clearly this leads to a lot of burden on the programmers. And we wanted to get rid of that burden, basically. Uh, I will say that our approach is an extreme. So it's, in the end, I don't think this is uh, the approach that one should take when they're designing a system because it's a lot of burden. Although, very interestingly, there are companies that tried to do this approach and they, they were reasonably successful. They didn't do it with MEM. Like the Fusion I.O., for example, they did it with Flash. They wanted to manage Flash and DRAM in a very similar way. And in the end, they got uh, bought up by other companies. But uh, I think they did a very interesting job. They had a very complex system to do what, uh, something similar to what, we, what I'm going to discuss. Basically, the goal is to have software transparent consistency in persistent memory systems. Software doesn't need to do anything. The system itself provides consistency. And the key idea here, if you want to do this, uh, I believe, I, I don't want to say this may be the only way, but this may be the only intuitive way that comes to mind. Maybe we'll come up with something else. The key idea is to periodically checkpoint the whole system state. And if you get a crash in the middle, you go back to a consistent checkpoint. That's the idea. So while the program is running, you take checkpoints once in a while of the system. And if you get a crash, you go back to the previous checkpoint and you restart from there when the system turns off. Of course, this is easier said than done. If you need to do it, there's a lot of detail that you need to deal with. So this is a hardware-based checkpointing mechanism. Hardware actually does all of the checkpointing transparently to the software because remember, we don't want to modify the software here. And it actually takes advantage of the characteristics of different devices, characteristics of the metadata overhead and checkpointing latency. Clearly, for example, if you checkpoint at a coarse granularity, like four kilobyte pages, uh, then the metadata to keep track of where is your checkpoint is easier. If you checkpoint at a small granularity, 64 bytes, blocks, your metadata becomes larger and the paper talks about this granularity very, very, uh, a lot, if you will. I'm not going to talk about it, but the key idea is really to adapt your granularity dynamically. Uh, this is very important also. You cannot just do this, basically. Run the program, checkpoint, uh, and wait for the checkpointing time. And then run the rest of the program. This is bad because it, it adds latency of checkpointing. You really want to overlap the checkpointing and execution. While you're taking a checkpoint, you keep running the program. That's the idea. And good systems almost uh, always do this. And finally, it adapts to DRAM and NVM characteristics. Uh, clearly, DRAM is very good at fast updates, fast writes. And VM is not very good at fast writes. So you actually do part of your check, checkpointing inside the DRAM, in this case, at a large granularity, for example. Of course, you need to be careful when you're doing that also. And in the end, the results show that uh, this performs uh, using both DRAM and NVM you get uh, within 5% of an idealized DRAM with zero cost consistency. So the results are actually very, very promising here in terms of performance and energy. But of course, the devil is in the detail. The devil is really in the complexity itself. And I'm not going to go into the complexity of the design. If you read the paper, you will see that it's a relatively complex design. Uh, but I'll give you this example. This is uh, one of the intuitive things over here, basically. Uh, you, you do the checkpointing this way. You need to run. And uh, so this is... This is a bad way of doing the checkpointing, right? You run the program application, and you say, okay, I'm going to take checkpoint. So what, is, what does it mean to take a checkpoint? Uh, in this, you, normally, you, you don't want to checkpoint the entire memory, right? You want to basically checkpoint only the updates that you've done in this epoch, let's say. Only the things that you've written to, that you've changed. And that's what you do over here. Ba you basically uh, write the new things uh, to that location and keep the old data because you may actually go to uh, recover back to the old old version of the memory location. That's the idea. So you do incremental checkpointing. You do, you do delta checkpointing, if you will. You, you only uh, keep track of things that are new and you, you keep the old state of things that you're supposed to change during this epoch. Only the blocks that you write to needs to uh, be checkpointed. Uh, and in the next epoch, let's assume that you get a crash over here. You go, uh, let's assume you get a crash over here. Actually, you go back to the old data, clearly. If you get a crash over here, you go back to the old data at the beginning of this. But if you do this checkpointing this way, that's not good because uh, this is additional latency. 
So that's the latency overhead. But there's also a storage overhead, which is you need to keep, tra uh, you need to keep the old values of the data that you updated during this period. So if you updated, let's say, one gigabyte, you need to keep the old values of one gigabyte because if the crash happens over here, you need to go back over here. Right? That's the idea. So there's a trade-off between latency and storage. We discussed this trade-off in many contexts, and this is another place where that trade-off exhibits itself. Whenever you want to improve latency, it comes at the overhead of capacity. You've seen this in tiered latency. I'm in a completely different context. This is a completely different context. You want to improve latency here? What do you want to do? You want to really do this right. Basically, you run. While you're taking a checkpoint, you keep running the next epoch. And while you're taking a checkpoint for, the, for that one, you keep running the next epoch, let's say. So you, this improves latency clearly because you're always running the program. The checkpointing is happening in the background, in a sense. But if you want to do that, now you need to, uh, you need to have more storage. Meaning that, for example, you updated a cache block over here, you're updating it again in epoch one, you need to have two copies of that cache block over here to be able to recover. So basically the storage overhead it comes from the uh, additional storage that you need to have because now you need to actually have uh, multiple checkpoints <coughs> alive at the same time. Because you can recover to this one or this one in the end. Does that make sense? This is very fundamental, as I said earlier. Latency capacity trade-off. You cannot get away from it. There's another place where you cannot get away from the latency capacity trade-off. If you want to improve latency, you go this way, but this increases your storage costs now because you clearly need to have multiple checkpoints alive at the same time, whereas here you need to have only single checkpoint alive. Meaning alive meaning you may actually recover to that checkpoint, so you need to really store the data uh, that you may recover to. Okay, so clearly this is high level. If you really want to low level details, and nitty gritty of how to do this. You can read this paper. You can actually download the source code and play with the simulator. Uh, it's a hybrid memory simulator, actually. Uh, in the end, we, uh, we did this with hybrid memory because there's no way you will get the performance close to DRAM if you don't have a hybrid memory in this case. You really need to have DRAM inside this uh, uh, system if you really want to uh, enable a good persistent memory system, let's say. So that's the takeaway, basically. With the characteristics that we have for PCM, you have to have some sort of DRAM if you want to really enable a persistent memory. OK, any questions? This is an interesting topic. I think this is fascinating. There needs to be more work in this area. I think punting on the programmer is not a good solution in the end. <laughs> OK, so clearly, but we want to ease the work on the programmer, and this previous work is toward that direction. There is some work that is also toward this direction, but to help the programmer identify what should be persistent, what should not be persistent, as I mentioned briefly. I'm not going to go over it. There's some work, and this is one work that we've done. I think it's very interesting. Basically, how do you actually build tools that can enable programmers to really understand the characteristics of their data? Because they may not really easily understand the characteristics of their data uh, in the end, but you can take a look at it uh, yourself. I think this is all I have on persistent uh, non uh, emerging memory technologies. But basically, I will finish with a slide that's similar to that, what I used before. Again, this is an emerging memory technology, right? This, well, this is a technology that's kind of emerged right now, but clearly there are other technologies that are in the pipeline. Uh, there are a lot of challenges related to it. Not, not only technology challenges, but also programming and use challenges. Again, this spans across the stack. Very similar to processing in memory, we're spanning across the stack. But regardless of challenges in underlying technology and overlying problems and requirements, I think the future is bright. Because as, as, as you can see, this can enable orders of magnitude improvements. And again, new application and computing system. We didn't talk about the new applications part, but uh, people are working on new applications to uh, take advantage of these emerging technologies clearly. And again, this really requires thinking across the stack and designing enabling systems over here. Because we actually talked about a lot of things over here uh, today. Uh, we didn't talk about algorithms, but even that is important, right? If you have this hybrid memory, how do you design your algorithm to take advantage of both of these memories? There is work in that area also. Okay, as I said, any new technology can be questioned. In fact, when we were uh, doing the work on f uh, phase change memory in 2007, we were questioned a lot. People were actually always asking, who cares about this technology? So I empathize with the people who were working on flash memory in 1970s or 80s they actually had the same criticism. And 
clearly flash memory is everywhere in our devices today, right? As I mentioned, we write papers like this related to flash memory today, and that has revolutionized our lives. I think persistent memory is also going to be like that going into the future. The good news is I think uh, now I can point people to this Intel's device, go and buy it. Uh, and you can, you can tell me if it's good or bad, right? <laughs> but this is the first generation, right? So you work on a technology starting from, uh, from an architecture level. There are also device level people who've been working on this technology from 1990s, right? Or 1980s, even earlier. Of course, they didn't envision it as part of DRAM in the earlier part, but 1990s, 2000s, all the IBM works that I mentioned earlier, the device level works, they envision this as a replacement for memory. And they've been working on it for even more than us. But it's good that actually these devices are now in the field because that actually shows that uh, the, these can be real. But of course, there's still more work uh, done because the devices will evolve in the field and also the way we use them will evolve. So it's not like the work has stopped because just a device hit the field. That's true for flash memory also. When the first flash memory device hit the field, it was very different from the device that we have today. Actually, a lot of these techniques that are employed in existing devices were developed after the first device hit the field. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in terms of both research and design in this uh, domain. One is enabling complete <coughs> persistent memory. How do you actually enable complete persistence? Uh, I briefly mentioned that you could actually make some of your caches persistent. STPM is a very good technology for that. Now imagine if all of your caches are persistent in addition to your physical memory. Uh, and of course the storage hierarchy, right? What can you do with that sort of system? How can, it, it becomes a much more robust system, actually. Uh, but how do you enable that? How do you take advantage of that? Uh, how do you think differently about such a system? Clearly there's a lot of work on hybrid memory systems. There are security and privacy issues in persistent memory. Uh, this was not there in DRAM, right? DRAM is volatile, you lose data. Even then people try to steal your data by putting your DRAM into a cold machine or pl place, right? But with persistent memory it's a lot easier, right? How do you actually keep, uh, get rid of some of these security and privacy issues? You, you have your data in the but I don't want to call it in the open, but all of your persistent data is there and it will not be deleted because the memory is non-multiple. So people are actually looking at encryption mechanisms for persistent memory, for example. Uh, whenever you write, you also encrypt the data. Of course, that comes at an overhead, right? Uh, do you really want a fast memory like this to be encrypted every time you write to it? That comes at an overhead because the encryption algorithms are not easy. So people are thinking about accelerating encryption inside the memory. Now that becomes, okay, you actually do processing inside person memory, which I realize I don't have over here, but pers processing inside person memory is another very uh, important direction over here. And there are also reliable and induce related problems, and how do you take advantage of processing capabilities inside these memories? So that's part of that dot, dot, dot over here. So I think the future is actually really, really interesting for these emerging technologies. Uh, it's, it's actually much, much more than what I had imagined when I started working on this in 2007. Because the way, when you start working on this, you also have some doubt, right, in the end. It's a technology that no, not, nothing has been proven about, in a sense. But over time, you discover a lot of really, really interesting research issues and design issues uh, in this sort of memory. And it's not just one part of the one, one device. The good news is really there are many, many potential devices, including carbon nanotubes, for example, which we really didn't talk about over here. But carbon nanotubes are another very interesting potential memory technology that could be used, which... Uh, which are, which are even at a, uh, at, a, at a less mature starting point uh, compared to PCM in 2007, let's say, today. Okay, any questions? I guess people are ready for a break. Okay, so let's take a break for 